Well, it's my pleasure to welcome the two, the first two speakers on the first keynote panel, uh, Professor John Robinson and Dr. Gerardo Durier. John Robinson is Professor of Musicology and Early Music Ensemble Director at the University of South Florida in Tampa. His articles on Renaissance, Baroque, and 20th century topics have appeared in various European American and Asian journals, and he's traveled internationally as a scholar performer on diverse Renaissance string and woodwind instruments. He's the author of Wang Chilin, Human Suffering and Compositional Trends in Contemporary China, plus other titles. And Dr. Gerardo Derrier is head of composition at Queensland Conservatorium Griffith University, excuse me. <clears throat> His compositions for electroacoustic media for chamber ensembles, choir, chamber operas, and theater have received international recognition at such prestigious venues as the Carnegie Hall, New York, the National Theater Taipei, the Netzawa Coyotl Hall in Mexico, and La Madeleine Cathedral, Paris. Thank you, John and Gerardo. I'll go ahead now, Nicholas. Yes, over to you now, Professor Robinson. Thank you. Okay, I'm trying to time this. Okay. Born into an incredibly poor family in Calcutta, India, Indian composer John Mayer never should have had any hope for a career in music. Yet he did through a combination of talent, luck and determination, uh, make his way to London to study at the Royal Academy on a scholarship eventually becoming a well-known professional orchestral violinist in London, as well as a very fine intercultural composer. It's important to know that uh, Mayer's South Indian mother had converted from Hinduism to Christianity. So she raised Mayer as a Roman Catholic. And one of Mayer's great passions in life once he moved to London was to go to the British Library and study a comparative world religions in his spare time. He particularly loved the Buddhist verses, the book of Buddhist verses known as the Dhammapada, and you can go on to the next slide now. Thank you. In 1990, Mayer's Birmingham Conservatory colleague Stephen Daw asked him, Mayer, if he would write a tribute to his deceased parents. And Mayer, knowing, having met Dawes' parents, said, well, how about, Stephen, if I write a piece on, based on the concept of a fusion of world religions? The result, Poetry Nokari, is a lengthy 50-minute, 10-movement work for chorus and orchestra. And it gets across Mayer's message that he felt would be a tribute to Dawes' parents, which is that, in the eyes of God, all people are equal. I'll let you read the stuff in the fine print here about what he says in the preface. And let's just say that uh, there's ideas from Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, many other world religions uh, merged together in this wonderful piece. Next slide. This is a uh, part of the text of Movement One. As you can see, it's a Buddhist oriented text. And we begin with uh, Mayer's own invented Tala. There's no Tala like this in 178, but he created one. And it has a strong connection with Buddhism because of chanting the word Dhammapada, medical percussion, and so on. Next slide, please. And you can just play the example now. On to the next slide on it. Thank you. At the end of movement one, we get a big surprise because over the narrator's spoken text, we have Renaissance style counterpoint. You can play the next or that example. Oh. Next. Next 
Next slide, please. Movement two, I think, must have been one of Mayer's uh, favorites, pure compassion, uh, because after all, he came from such a poor family and lived a hard life uh, for himself. Uh, this uh, has a lot of Indian style melodies in it mixed up with several different ragas you see here. But the essence of movement two is this poor man calling out to God in desperation, please God help me and I will become your servant. And then the obnoxious prophet comes in and says, how dare you speak to my God this way. Uh, so the woodwinds are playing a 12 tone row and uh, while the uh, poor man is calling out in the narration. Please play the example. The prophet once heard a poor beggar praying. Oh God, show me where you are and I will become your servant. I will clean your shoes, comb your hair, sew your clothes and fetch your milk. Okay, next slide, please. Now, towards the end of movement two, God speaks in an authoritative narrative voice, which gets back into an Indian style with a different raga and droning tampuras. And you see what God's criticism is of the prophet uh, leading us to a statement from the Beatitudes. Uh, play the example, please. Next slide, please. And we're skipping this now that you memorized everything in this slide for lack of time. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Movement five is a special movement based on the Credo text, but it's Mayer's own politically correct version of the Credo text, which takes only selected words. For example, he doesn't say Credo in Unum Deo, I believe in one God, he says, I believe in God. That way he's making it generic to any religions. Plenty of tons of melodic and rhythmic layers superimposed on top of one another here with tabla drums, cymbals, et cetera. And in the middle section, you will hear uh, the men's choir chanting six different rhythmic patterns based on the Kaida rhythmic variations the tabla players use, along with the seventh layer that's eventually added in the, the women's voices, which uh, is the credo text. Okay, next slide. And you can play the example. And now you can play this example. This is the Kaida variations chanted by the choir. <laughs>
Okay, next slide, please, Nicholas. And now that you memorize what I say here about movement six, seven, eight, nine, let's go on to the next slide, please. According to what I see, I think I have done nine minutes already, so I may have to make this short. Uh, movement 10, the concluding movement, is based on the concept of peace on earth, and this is part of the text here. You have us not already do this in the strings with slower moving, tranquil, peace of the Lord voices uh, in the choir, raga probably from the Asafari thought, and uh, basically it concludes with an acceptance of multiple ways of worshiping God. Next slide, please. And I think to speed up a little bit, Nicholas, let's pretend that you heard the first example. What I really want you to hear is the second example down here at the bottom. Uh, no, go back one slide. Yeah, at the very bottom, that one, yeah. That's the last chord. Right here comes the eight note chord. You can see what I wrote here. Next slide, please. Poetry Nakari was pre premiered at the Birmingham Conservatoire on July 7th, 1995. And sadly, that has been the only performance in more than 26 years. Uh, you can see a comment from Stephen Dawes' letter, glowing letter that he sent to his friend John Mayer, uh, saying how pleased he was with, was with it. However, Mayer, after the premiere performance and only performance said, he thought it was a miserable failure since people were offended by the notion that all religions were one and equal, always preferring to believe that their religion was the one true path for the whole world, of course. Uh, nevertheless, Poetia Nakari is an unusual work for Mayer with a vast array of melodic styles and an incredibly profound message to the peoples of the world for a fellow who loved comparative world religions more than a quarter of a century after its creation. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, John. Gerardo. Gerardo, are you there? <clears throat> Unmute. Yes. There we go. Yes. Here we go. I lost my my own face in the in the mix of all this. Um, press the wrong button. Apologies. Thank you very much, and thanks uh, to um, uh, Richard Pektovich and uh, Nick Ng for the fantastic invitation, and to Professor uh, Diane Blom uh, as well. Uh, it was a delight to hear uh, about the presentation. Uh, by uh, uh, Robert uh, just now. It reminds me of uh, um, John, uh, a previous study that I have done uh, venturing into the, um, how the, after the Council uh, Vatican II, uh, it was possible for composers to use vernacular languages in the mass. So many vernacular musicians like Bayer himself were able to afford longer complex compositions and digest the, the meanings of particular folk genres and vernacular genres with the meanings of the particular dogmas and, and religions. Uh, in regard to that position is that I uh, uh, make my contribution to uh, the symposium, having first looked at the complex greed of, um, or as I call it, the topical mesh of this year's symposium. And um, I was very grateful first that, that the symposium is repeating, that it's uh, happening again this year, uh, because that allows uh, refreshing, recalibration, rebalancing, 
reviewing, sometimes correcting our concepts and perspectives. So I made that a little representation to share what is that went to my head when I saw this is pretty good. So the topical mesh of the symposium this year contains the notions of on tradition, on innovation, on creativity, uh, uh, on ethnography, and that from also from the perspective of the indigenous people, and you add to that the human perspective. And uh, I, I'm aware that as long as we include the multicultural, in, intercultural, and the intrapersonal as well, we have a fantastic mesh, multicolor, diverse, uh, heterophonic, if you want. And the way I grew up and made my artistic practice was within that conception as well. So the perception of diversity and heterogeneity uh, in musical practice is not something that I sought as something that I had to conquer or to convince myself or to learn. It was the natural way of growing up. And uh, just moving to other parts of the world and understanding that in other parts of the world, musical practices tend to follow just one thread or they believe that is one thread actually, uh, it was quite puzzling. So I'm delight delighted that we are discussing uh, and sharing this moment of uh, intense acknowledgement uh, and ambition on the diversity. The way I understood this was uh, a big, uh, fantastic moment for reminding ourselves, which is the, an important practice of spiritual life, especially regarding the ritual um, formalities. Uh, they offer an opportunity for remind people about things that we should know all the time, but we can't because of our particular human configuration. So when I re read on tradition, I thought this is, uh, may relate to our awareness and education regarding the world we have been given. So there's no way to avoid that. Um, on innovation may account for our readiness for change or reconfiguring or recalibrating ourselves in given context. So if we are alive and we are in a context, there's no way to uh, avoid innovation. On creativity may refer to our doing all this with as broad and open sky mindset as much as with respect to the constraints and limitations of the given context, especially the traditions, what we were given. And on ethnography, which is more formal, can enhance our awareness and sensibility to the particular values and dynamics that pervade in our particular circumstances. And this is something that has informed lots of my practice since I remember all the music that I wrote was music that was performed because it was created for the people around me and for the means that were uh, available or afforded to our circumstances. Then focusing on the indigenous domain can inform us of the updating we must do as it is obvious that we have the propensity to blind ourselves of the presence, interest and needs of others. So much so that when this accumulates, we are left with a huge task of remediation, truth telling, rebalancing and asking forgiveness uh, to ourselves as well. Assume an advantage point then from the all human domain, probably a nice example from the composition that uh, John uh, showed before. From the all human standpoint, it can remind us that we are not only inclined to recurrent blindness to groups, in which we might belong, but also about our puzzling disposition for ignoring our humanity altogether from time to time and our relatedness with all existence from time to time. And that's an aspect that our spiritual practices and some dogmatic practices as well also tend to accomplish, or at least that's an ambition of reminding ourselves that uh, our sense of se separateness uh, is uh, it's our, it's our own human trademark, but may not be true, actually. Um, so in regard to that, uh, I thought 
that in for this presentation, I will come with a, a little offering of uh, three little morsels that do not represent completely my composition or all my inclinations when I create music, but just three things to share uh, connections of how in my musical practice and my artistic uh, practice, uh, I proceed in a way that is very close to the devotional attitude, very similar to what we call state of uh, extended praying, um, in which many things uh, are, I try to uh, re ligare, to reconnect uh, in the old sense of religion. Uh, everything that is presented uh, in my life at the moment. Trying to align the three examples with a particular topic in all the individual threads that conform the topical mesh of the symposium, I chose to connect with the topic uh, from Professor Diana Blom. Um, uh, that means the intersections of tra traumatic experiences and music and spirituality. So I, I call this little collection three instances of lucky escapes. Uh, uh, it's a little bit of a gesture of humor because I am a strong believer that humor is a great, uh, um, great medicine for chaos against uh, chaos. So I chose the first moment I call it liberanos a malo, uh, which those who come from the Latin or Christian traditions may recognize as the the last thing that the, in the Lord's prayer, humans dare to ask. So after the moment of praying the God uh, comes the request, you know, give us the bread and uh, forgives uh, when we do wrong and, and uh, please uh, get rid of the devil or evil. Except that in the Lord's prayer, uh, at least in Latin, there's no please. So humans just ask and forgot to say please, which Probably that's the reason why things are still not going our way. So Libera Nos Amalo, which comes from a piece, uh, Tornos del Arcangel, which I will illustrate shortly. The other moment I call it Emerging from Hell, which is uh, alluding to my use of uh, Dante Alighieri's um, Inferno, which I wrote for a piece uh, in support of, uh, or a part of the ANSAC ceremonies of 2018. And the last example is about recovering from a black hole. So three important moments that we can feel a little bit frightened to go through, but uh, our uh, sense of connection can be restored. So the note, the Tonos del Arcangel is one of a collection of cantatas that I wrote for uh, choir, soloist, always bringing some instruments that can be manufactured, homemade, or from different traditions around the world. The fourth cantata is tunes or, or airs of the archangel, and it has four movements, and it's a, a piece that I created to reflect or in sync with um, uh, uh, the different religions describe this moment of the need of humans to clear the space, to clear earth first before humans have been created. And that piece came at the moment when a friend asked me for the work in dedication to his father that had just passed away. And we premiered the piece a few days after a young student from Korea was shot in the street by a person that was sick and armed. Um, and we dedicated the concert to that event. What I'm going to play is just the last minute and 25 seconds of the fourth movement of this cantata, um, which I explained there, this is the moment where the choir sings the glorious, the victory of the archangel against the devil, or so he thinks. Um, and the piece ends there with a the bassoon and then a bering bow, which is a traditional instrument to accompany the practice of capoeira, which is a martial arts in Brazil, creates that coda in, in a ghostly ending, perhaps hinting that the fight is not over as the Gregorian chant uh, made us think.
The next little fragment is again a transition to the last movement of a work that I wrote for uh, the ANZAC uh, commemorations in 2018. And as Dr. Blum may remember, that particular year was dedicated to the situation of the returning combatants and post-traumatic uh, stress, stress disorder. Um, and to abort that project, I, I worked with several servicemen uh, from the Air Forces and, uh, and the Army that provide me with uh, particular narrations. And I fundamentally resorted to a combination of texts from uh, my Major General John Cantwell, um, Exit Wound. Um, it's a very profound truth-telling aspect. And, and a moment from uh, the Divine Comedy, uh, Inferno. And this is a moment where um, at the very end, the guide finally leads uh, the two travelers out into the open, emerging from, from hell. Um, my notes there is that uh, there is a very haunting uh, connection of the French horn and the saxophone uh, leading to that getting out of the uh, inferno. Uh, sorry for that. I've been obsessed with belts for a long time. I wear a belt every that day. Sometimes and there's like three things that always drove me crazy about belts. All right. You have sure. My guide and I came on that hidden road to make our way back into the bright world. And with no care for any rest, we climbed. He first, I followed, until I saw through a round opening those things of beauty heaven bears. It was from there that we emerged to see the stars. Thank you. How am I doing with time? You're, you're, it's, it's 9.47, so you're a bit over time. Okay, so yeah. I can, I can leave, I can skip the next example because uh, all the viewers can have access to the web page that contains all these examples already in the link. Um, my ending conclusions would be that if I had to provide a keynote aspect to uh, this presentation, 
to this presentation, probably the, the key word for this could be the Spanish word escuchemos, um, which is, you know, just one word, three syllables, very similar to let us listen or escuchemonos, a little bit longer, which implies let us listen up to ourselves and to each other. So all the sounds are there. There's no way to blind ourselves to what's already there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerardo, and thank you, John. Presentations and musical excerpts, it's, a, it's always a very rich, rich combination. And, and Gerardo, Pam and I look forward to your comments on our war music presentation a bit later in the day. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you this morning from my home, which is on the land of the Camaragal people of the Aora Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name's Jocelyn Che. In Chinese, that would be Mei Zolin, and perhaps you might like to note that because in this panel, we shall be considering ethnomusicography in Australia and China. And I'm an adjunct professor at the Institute for Chinese and Australian Culture at Western Sydney University. I'm now going to introduce each speaker in order, and each speaker has only 10 minutes. So if they exceed that, I'm going to tell them off by or mark the, the passing of time with my clapsticks. So let me first introduce um, Dr. Catherine Ingram, who is a le lecturer in ethnomusicology at the Conservatorium of Music in Sydney and has held research fellowships at SOAS in London at the International Institute of Asian Studies in the Netherlands and the Shanghai Conservatorium of Music. And over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much, um, Jocelyn. So I'm speaking to you all from the land of the Wongal people of the Aora Nation, and I acknowledge them and their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'd like to make some brief observations on how spirituality is featured in connection with my research in Southwest in China. I hope I can also provide some insight into recent and rich ethnomusicological connections and dialogue between China and Australia that I'm so happy to be part of. So over the past 17 years, I've had the great privilege of spending around 36 months or so on multiple visits, living and conducting research with scum or in Chinese song, minority people in Guizhou province and adjoining areas. Like many other ethnomusicologists aiming to understand the musical culture of a community, it was not initially my particular aim to explore spiritual aspects of gum musical culture. However, I soon learned that the most important gum musical activities had very important spiritual dimensions. So although I'd not consider myself an expert on analyzing those spiritual dimensions, Although it hasn't been my main research focus, it's been an ongoing presence in my research. It seems that this experience is common to many other researchers in ethnomusicology, and I wonder if that includes others who are presenting today. Within gum musical culture, the most important event of the year in southern gum regions is Nyo Sasi. Sa is a word that also means paternal grandmother, but refers here to the main gum deity, a female figure. The Muir for Sasi involves a parade and various forms of circle singing. This is an English translation of the brief description of this ritual that Wu Jicheng, who you see here, provided for a CCTV documentary we were both involved with. And you'll notice how singing and various types of sonic performance are central. Nyosasi is a festival honoring the most significant heroine of the gum people. The public face of the festival begins later in the day when members of the Lakjiang clan from a nearby village carry a flag into Jilong, the main village. Their procession is accompanied with gongs, cymbals, firecrackers and explosions and represents gum people's historical migration from Jiangxi province to this area. Elders then move to a location just outside a nearby home and one man begins a recitation 
over several large buckets of tea. This recitation ensures the safety, good harvest and good health of all the people of the village for the coming year. The tea is considered to be a gift from Sasi and each person takes a sip of tea to ensure good health for the year. Then the traditional procession around the village begins. As people walk, there is a continuous sound of firecrackers, gongs, cymbals and drums. These rid the village of bad spirits and protect the village. The procession concludes at Saklan. For generations, this has been the sacred place where songs are sung to invite Sasi to the village to ask for her protection and blessing when villagers leave for important occasions. As you can see from this translation of one section of the lyrics to the call and response Gaye song, usually sung at this point, the lyrics describe this deity, Sa, and her role in the community. The event concludes after it moves to a larger location with further singing for Sa, both as the whole community and finally as a um, smaller group of women. So there are never images of Sa, but the main way her presence is felt in a physical sense in these gum villages is through Nan Sa, House to Sa. These buildings, as you see here, remain closed throughout the entire year and are only opened at Lunar New Year. As I went to sing um, choral gum big songs with friends and teachers night after night in these places and other locations, I came to understand how gum big song singing in these spaces had a particular character, serious, um, important, and was used as an offering to star. Gradually from these kinds of experiences, I also realized that spiritual figures such as Sa, or figures that people also sang to in the same period, which were associated with other locations in the village, have to be understood as participants in these events. At Sydney Conservatorium, we were fortunate to be able to invite six gum singers for the 2017 Songs of Home event with the Madjura singers. More recently in 2019, Gum Singers and I met in Beijing to screen the documentary of the Songs, and Home, Songs of Home event and give two keynote presentations at a major international seminar on oral tradition research at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. For my gum friend, Sa is a participant in the, in the music related to these events as well. For example, my friend sang the same circle song for Sa in the early morning darkness before leaving their village to ensure that Sa blessed and protected them on their travels. In reflecting on how spirituality is being connected with my research in Southwest China, besides the importance of an expanded notion of participation that includes spiritual figures, I'm reminded again of the importance of detailed ethnographic work that many ethnomusicologists do, and that enables this kind of deeper understanding of spirituality and music connections. Another connection that's been integral to my research is with my colleagues in China. So from the beginning of my research, I received support from colleagues at Shanghai Conservatory, especially at the Research Institute for Ritual Music in China. It was a pleasure to teach post-grade classes there in 2014, 2016 and 2017, give a number of lectures and develop connections with a brilliant new generation of scholars who are now spread across many parts of China. Since I began working at Sydney Conservatorium in 2014, 
We've welcomed a wide range of researchers, postdoc fellows and postgrad students working on an incredibly diverse range of different musics related to China. Of the many research events we've held, this 2018 event was another milestone as it brought together my drum colleagues in Guangxi and others working on Thai related musics, such as gum, zhuang and so on, in discussion with Sydney-based researchers led in this e event by my then colleague, well-known Indigenous researcher, Dr. Vincent Bracknell. So as an Australian ethnomusicologist who has long-standing relationships with many different colleagues and cu cultural custodians in China, it feels especially rewarding to be able to play some part in strengthening those connections on the Australian side. And I imagine that for Dr. Nicholas Ng and others involved in organizing this event, you might have the same feeling as well. I'd like to thank you and all the presenters for your efforts in helping to maintain these really rich Australia-Chinese research connections. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Uh, before taking questions, I'd like to um, move on to um, our international speaker, Professor uh, Yu Hui, and uh, introduce him and ask him also to, to speak to us for about 10 minutes, following which there will be time for questions. So Professor Yu is the only musicologist who has been inducted as the Changjiang Scholar and distinguished professor of the Chinese Ministry of Education. He received his PhD in ethnomusicology from Wesleyan University in the States in 2000 and is currently a distinguished professor at Yunnan University and chair professor at Xiamen University. So over to you, Professor Yu, and welcome to Australia. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Chair. Uh, uh, is that okay? Can you can you hear me clearly? Very clearly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm very, uh, and this is a very uh, uh, good opportunity uh, for me to visit Australia again. Um, actually, uh, my original topic today was about the uh, Gu Qing and the modern Chinese nation nationalism that probably fit the theme of music and spirituality better. But um, as actually this week uh, is the uh, anniversary of the passing of uh, Professor Chen Ying Shi, who was also related to Australia very much in the past. And also I saw many familiar names on the program yesterday. So I, I thought uh, maybe I should change my mind. I changed the topic to celebrate our shared past and uh, celebrate our friendship in this opportunity uh, with so many um, old friends and uh, many new friends we are going to make. So um, today I'm going to talking about the, the, the topic is the musicological exchange between China and Australia in the 1980s, 1990s. Um, because I, uh, when I uh, uh, talked with Nick previously and she, he said that the spirituality is broadly defined for this um, uh, conference. And I think the, the, um, the friendship, sharing, compassion, which also should be included in the spirituality. So, um, uh, so this, this is why I'm gonna switch the topic, which is, I think is more relevant to the, our new friend, and especially um, I virtually visited Australia 30 years, um, 30 years later. And Dr. Stephen Wilde, Dr. Yang Mu, and Dr. Nicholas Lin all wrote about music encounters between Australia and China before. So my talk today is from my personal experience from China to supplement their previous account. As the two decades of history in 1980s and 1990s were important for China, as the country was searching for the future path after the Cultural Revolution, before joining WTO to boost economy, now become the second largest economy in the world. In the 1979, the virtuoso violinist Isaac Stern received an invitation to tour the country of China. The film about a monthly long journey 
won the best Oscar documentary in 1981, making some of the best classical musicians and their ability known to the outside world. And Professor John Painter, the cellist and then the director of the Canberra School of Music, visited Shanghai and taught at the conservatory for a short period of time in 1987. She developed a very close friendship with Professor Tan Shu Jin, a renowned violinist and vice, chair, vice president of Shanghai Conservatory, who appeared in the documentary talking about his torture in the Cultural Revolution. And Professor John Painter, passion and dedication to teaching the students left a deep impression on many people in Shanghai, who always mentioned his name in 1993, when I was about to visit Australia with Professor Li Minxiong. The culture exchange. The culture exchange in ethnology field between Australia and China started after the 1980s through mm -hmm. channels. First is the student exchange. Many Chinese Australian families started to send their children to study music in China after 1980s. Among them, two I want to mention. One is called the uh, her Chinese name is Chu Chu Mei, but I do not remember her English name. Neither many more of my classmates, probably because her Chinese is so good. She studies at the musicology department. The other one is. And uh, Li Shu Yi, whose English name is Elsa Li, who studied Chinese percussion with Professor Li Minxiu and earned a PhD in ethnomusicology at the University of Adelaide later on. Other Australian students, including Tony Wheeler, we just heard him playing the Gu Qin, also studied in China during that period. In the meantime, many Chinese students started studying in Australia for master's the PhD degrees in ethnomusicology amid the first wave of Chinese migration to West countries after the Cultural Revolution, which caused the severe brain drain for the country. <laughs> Among them, Dr. Yang Mu and Dr. Wang Zhenting here. The, uh, the second channel is through the scholar, scholars of the so-called Peking School the, the students of Lawrence Peking focusing on the studies of the East Asian history, historical music tradition, and Alan Merritt, who was then a professor at Sydney University, the one of them, and became a bridge to the communications between the two countries. His research on tablets of Chinese five stream pipa preserved in Japan, made known in China, and was put into performance with the help of Professor Chen Yingshi. And one of his students, Carly Rockwell, spent three years with her husband, Michael Sauer, at the Shanghai Normal University studying Chinese language and music. During the time she made a contact with Professor Chen and connected the musicologist in Shanghai with the colleagues in Canberra. Carly passed away in 1991 at a relatively young age. A friend and colleagues in Canberra establishes the Cowley Rockwell Foundation. Part of the fund was used to bring Chinese musicians to teach and perform in Australia, which made the visit by Professor Li Minxiu and myself possible. The third channel was through the ethnomusicologists studying in Aboriginal music and Dr. Stephen Wilde has made outstanding contribution. We should never forget his effort and contribution. Among Western ethnomusicologists, we see trainings in anthropology of music. I think Stephen was probably the first one to visit China and connect with a Chinese colleague after the Cultural Revolution. The first, first visit was considered by our uh, first visit by uh, Dr. Stephen Wilde was considered important uh, because. Uh, was con considered uh, important because his uh, status as a chairman of the Australia, uh, Australia of Musicological Society and in Chinese context, he was considered part of a semi-official and he received a work, a 
warm welcome in Shanghai, uh, including his uh, uh, public speech in the Association of Shanghai Musicians and the Oriental Music Society. And a conservatory even arranged uh, the faculty members to play in the tea house and garden specifically for women, which was unprecedented. I never heard any other guest receive such a privilege in, 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 um, to my knowledge. The, uh, the, the academic visit by the Chinese musicologist was the first visit was made by Professor Chen Yingshi. His paper on the theory of Chinese tunings and temperament studies, translated by Chloe Rockwell, published in Musicology in Australia, which was the first ever academic paper on Chinese music published in Australia. He was subsequently invited to give a speech at the annual meeting of the Australian Musicological Society. According to Professor Chen, the Australian student I mentioned before, Chi Chu Mei, made the recommendation. Professor Jiang Qing of the Central Conservatory was invited to visit Australia for the same conference, which was recommended, re recommended by Dr. Yang Mu. During a UNESCO meeting in, on traditional Chinese music uh, in Beijing, in Stephen, the first visit to China, he met Professor Li Minxiu, a famous Chinese music theorist and Chinese percussionist. The possible visit by Professor Li to Australia and teach and perform was discussed in Stephen's first visit to China in 1987. And the second visit in 1991 also when I was when I joined the conservatory as a young faculty member. The first the visit was successful. Dr. Stephen Wilde and Dr. Yang Mu all wrote about this visit. It took place in 1997 or 1993, which was unprecedented in Australian history. One of the biggest concerts featuring Professor Lee was broadcast by Australian National Corporation, National Broadcasting Corporation, as publicized in many other Australian media. The concert brought the finest Chinese musicians from many parts of Australia to Canberra to participate in the conference. And Esther Lee shipped her Chinese set drum from Adelaide to Canberra. Besides teaching and performing in Canberra, Professor Lee and I also had uh, the opportunity to visit the University of New, New England and the Griffith University arranged by Stephen. The trip opened our mind to the outside world. During the time, only privileged Chinese could have the chance to travel outside of China. Australia and China are two of the big, largest countries in the Asia Pacific region. The influence of Chinese culture in Australia through the increasing population of Chinese immigrants make understanding of Chinese culture more important than ever. Australia's influence of Western cultures in China through the academic exchange helped Chinese scholars in many disciplines in both science and the humanities. Ethnological scholarship of Australia and China shared many commonalities in the past. Both have been heavily influenced by European scholars rather than American ones. And we emphasize the analytical approach. Nevertheless, Australia has its unique policy and scholarship approaches to Aboriginal culture and music, to which Chinese scholars and policymakers have much to learn in order to develop a better way to preserve, respect, and transmit the music cultures of ethnic minority groups in China. Thank you very much. That's all my uh, presentation. Well, thank you so much, Professor. You, uh, I really listened with great interest because you take me back to some of my own personal experience. I feel very proud to have played a small part in initiating some of these music exchanges between Australia and China. Uh, even b before the 1980s, there was a beginning. Uh, and I'd just quickly like to mention as examples a couple of the, the big names in uh, Australian um, performing music history um, who I got involved in exchanges with China, including John Kuro of, uh, from Brisbane and uh, Jan Sedivka from Hobart. And there are many other names I could mention. It, it's a, a very fruitful history and 
and sometime it will all be written up and studied. Um, but I'm now moving on to a time for questions. And uh, if people wish to pose a question, you can use the chat function on your screen. But I will take this opportunity, as we have only a few minutes left, um, to put in my first question, which is to ask both um, Catherine and you, Professor Yu, because uh, you are active in this field of um, musicology at the moment. Um, where do you see your work? Um, as it, it perhaps in the past you felt that in working in, in um, ethnomusicology, you were a little bit away from the mainstream. Uh, is your work now becoming um, more engaged in the center or or uh, do you see some new trends emerging in uh, music uh, musicology that we should be aware of what are the fields for co cooperation between australia and china in the future um, i'll ask professor you to start first okay thank you uh, actually uh Ethnomusicology is a not native Chinese technology. It was from West. And China, China actually learned ethnomusicology only uh, after the Cultural Revolution. Uh, from Japan, the term actually was translated from Japan because it's close to China and the Chinese relationship with the West countries well, is much slower than with the uh, Japan. And ethnomusicology is still uh, kind of, uh, uh, I would say that because China has its own music scholarship uh, for the southern three years, studying its own traditional music and it developed its system of mus musicological studies. So ethnomusicology at this moment, I think is more focused on the ethnic minorities. And the reason why I moved to Yunnan University because Yunnan is the province in China which has the most uh, the ethnic minority. It has like 23 ethnic minorities in Yunnan province. So it's a rich uh, field to study the ethnic minority music in, in, in China. So ethnic psychology, this is always a problem because um, usually ethnic psychology uh, does not study the music of ourselves. So that for the Han people, Majority of Han people, this is always a problematic. So, uh, but the uh, Yunnan University has a very strong and um, uh, discipline of the uh, uh, ethnic studies, or called the Minzu, which is hard to translate into uh, 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 English, but uh, usually it's very close, like anthropology or ethnic, ethnic group studies. So, um, um, ethnic music college. In China, I think in the future it will be um, on the, uh, the research preserv preservation and uh, the um, transmission of ethnic minority groups in, in China. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, do you have some comments? Yes, thanks, Jocelyn, and thanks a lot, Professor Yu. It's wonderful to hear that historical background mm. to the things that I'm experiencing today. And I know some of it, but you filled in some great gaps as well. Um, I, it made me really reflect on the fact that um, while I'm, of course, aware of what you've mentioned, Professor Yu, about um, what ethnomusicology is in a Chinese context, I actually um, feel that for myself and for my colleagues, both in Australia and China, we we don't worry about um, disciplinary boundaries too much. Um, you know, I have many, I've had um, students in Australia who are Han Chinese and use ethnomusicological techniques to look at their own music. I've worked with scholars on Chinese music who might be from folklore studies, from religious studies, from so many different um, areas. And I, I think um, one of the things I really appreciate in China um, is that people are very willing to consider music in that very broad perspective where we need to as ethnomusicologists, we can't just focus on one thing. So I've, um, I've never felt that I wasn't part of the mainstream. And in fact, when I go to China, I feel like there's so many more people who are 
who love to research um, music, but actually um, it's, a, it's a really wonderful place to, to be a part of in terms of a research atmosphere. Yeah, so I hope we'll see a lot more, um, you know, collaborative research from people from different countries working on the same issues together, because I think we can, we just bring our own unique approaches and perspectives and we can understand things um, much better in that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think as time is short, um, I, I won't um, put any more questions, but I just before closing, um, like to mention an, another area that uh, perhaps uh, Nicholas is the best person to speak about, and that is the, the place of um, ethnic Chinese music in Australian culture. Um, and that's an, another, a whole different topic which uh, um, he is exploring and um, we hope to, there, there will be some great results coming from his continuing research in this area. So um, uh, with that comment, um, I would like to close this key, keynote session and thank all the participants and thank the audience also uh, for, for your participation under these strange circumstances of us being in our homes and, and yet able to communicate uh, across space uh, and time. Um, and uh, I hope this collaboration will bring many blessings to everyone involved. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn, for sharing this session so wonderfully. And thank you very much, Catherine and Professor Yu as well. Um, I failed to mention at the start, because time was short, that Jocelyn has played such a key role in Australia-China exchange as former consul um, at Hong Kong, in Hong Kong and also working in diplomatic relations at the Australian Embassy in Beijing. Um, so thank you very much. We're honoured to have you here. So before we start, I'd just like to say that I'm speaking from Darug land and I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the custodians of this land and the lands on which we're all zooming today. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly introduce um, John and Eve um, and hand it over to them. Um, I'll let you know that I've got a little, um, that a symbol here that I will use if I need to, um, but um, hopefully we won't need to do that. So um, firstly, Eve, Eve Duncan, Eve's music explores aspects of Australian identity through the environment, architecture, and myriad strands of spiritual perspectives. Her music has been performed at the International Alliance of Women in Music Festival in Korea, and a range of prestigious international festivals in Colorado, Switzerland, Bucharest, Romania, Israel, Thailand, the Philippines, Korea, and Japan. Um, and Dr. John Napier, um, once a virtuoso boy soprano, John has enjoyed a colorful career as an orchestral chamber and contemporary cellist, performing in North America, Mexico, Jamaica, United Kingdom, Germany, Italy, India, China, Hong Kong, the Philippines, Japan, Indonesia, and New Zealand. He researches Hindustani classical music and is a senior lecturer in ethnomusicology at the University of New South Wales. So a lot of international experience um, there between them. And without further ado, I will hand it over. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Claire, can you hear me? Uh, yes, loud and clear. Yeah, good. Um, my main problem will be when I try and play an iMovie and is uh, Nicholas there? No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Nicholas, it's, I'm trying to uh, find my movie and I may not be able to, so I might ask you to play uh, my movie when I ask you to. Is that okay? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll get started. Um, Approaching Venice is the overture of my opera, The Aspen Papers, and it is set in Venice. The audience is positioned as if in a boat travelling towards the city as it was approached for hundreds of years. The overture is a musical water journey from the present into the psychological inner spaces of the opera. 
the soft architecture of coastal nature is evoked through Filipino drum and gong kulantang technique by using interlocking patterns of small rhythmic cells. The cells form a drone described by Filipino composer Jose Maceda as a center of time in which controls melody and the space around which melody moves. It is a pillar which supports music itself like a law of nature and an equilibrium between man and nature. My rhythmic motive was adopted from the overture of Monteverdi's opera Orfeo. By combining Kulintang interlocking rhythm with the motive of a Venetian composer, I drew the soft architecture of coastal nature into proximity with nearby Venice. The materiality and spirituality of Venice is mirrored in the dark depths of the water and the brilliant artistry of marble buildings seen as one approaches Venice by boat. Chiara Scuro, an effective contrasted light and shadow was used by Venetian artists such as Titian to give depth to color. In my overture, tonal Chiara Scuro is used in bass register string tremolo, the use of seconds and horizontal brass lines to suggest the depths of dark seawater and the psychological depths of the ensuing opera. This is contrasted with higher register string tremolos that shimmer, evoking the dazzling light of a marble city reflected upon water. Behind my use of tonal chiaroscuro lies the darkness and light experienced in daily meditation and an ongoing study of Steiner Christian spirituality. This is a preparation in which I remember that Steiner said, we understand the speech of the gods by learning how to listen with our hearts, not by intellectual agility. Through orchestral chiaroscuro, I interpolate the inner space, the oku of Venice into the overture. Japanese oku is described by architect Fumihiko Maki as the spiritual center that lies at the core of a multi-layered space. Oku has its origins in early Shinto shrines located by waterfalls and rocks found within mountains. Likewise, my Australian oku, my time and space sensibility that was formed by a childhood in Australia, combines spiritual and geographical spatial aspects. I often experience the Australian continent as a sea of land. Travellers journeying into Venice past the majestic Chiesa Il Redentore, designed by Andrea Palladio. The church was built as thanks for deliverance from a plague that killed a third of Venice's population in the late 16th century. Palladio uses a classical facade combined with a huge cupola. The outline of the form displays clarity and balance consistent with Venice's unique political and religious structure. It is a huge church built of marble and stone Dense materials used confidently that are a counterbalance to the sea's perpetual movement and to the memory of the anguish brought to Venice by the plague. I created a parallel to the length of the church and the timing of the music. Its total length of 227 feet is experienced by the audience as though they are passing by it in their boat in two minutes and 20 seconds. I created a parallel in the register of the music to the height of the two roof lines and to the rise and fall of the midpoint of the cupola. Thus the, architecture, the architectural dimensions of Palladio's church intersect sonically with modal harmony to embed into the music an intrinsic aspect of Venice's architectural and inner oku space. We're going to hear the um, the overture now and I've added an iMovie because I knew we had such a short amount of time and the iMovie is is not a movie it's just put in the last week to bring um, some of those ideas visually as you hear the um, overture. Thank you Nicholas. Okay my pleasure. Thank you. 
Um, Claire, would you like me just to stop there because I realize we're so very late. I, sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, yeah, uh, you, you've got a, um, a minute or two if you'd like to I'll, I'll wrap it read off. a sentence from my conclusion. Yes. Um, in the overture, my Steiner Christian spirituality and my Australian Oku inner space sensibility enlivened my artistry. I identified the Oku inner space of Venice as residing in the contrast of the soft architecture of its coastal nature and the hard architecture of its illuminating and sublime buildings. I used the techniques of Filipino kulin pang interlocking, interlocking rhythmic cells, tonal chiaroscuro in orchestral color, and I interpolated the non-musical mathematics of architecture into the music to allow the overture to bring the audience from everyday life into the opera set in Venice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I will ask a question at the end, um, and um, I'm sure other people uh, have many thoughts and questions as well. But um, we'll go straight on to John first, and then we'll we'll have hopefully time for questions at the end. Hello. I'm just sharing my screen. I hope you can see that. Yeah, that's good. Good, good. Okay, you can see that today has uh, something quite different even from when we started. Um, John, your voice is quite soft. Yes, I have a new headset and I've oh, there we are. forgotten how to use it. I still haven't learned how to use the headset. Okay. <laughs> it's good now. So, yeah, great. So the Cordova are an, ethno an ethno-linguistic group who have sufficient cultural, social, and economic visibility to give their name to the district of Kodagu in Karnataka in the south of India. And you can see from my pointer, the district is here, and then you can see Karnataka here, which gives you an idea of uh, where they actually are. Okay. I'm going to briefly examine three processions, two associated with temples, the third not. It's not so much an interest here in the conflation of the sacred and the secular, but what I am interested in is the natural association of the sacred and the theatrical, in which particular aspects of and tensions within Kodavame, the Kodava way of life, are self-consciously performed, aestheticized and enjoyed. One of the tensions within Kodavame is that between a traditional system of animism and ancestor worship and mainstream Sanskritic Hinduism. This is routinely enacted in various temple festivals. Here, that of Pudiyodi, a renegade daughter of the god Shiva, who grows in stature by murdering a Brahmin priest and enslaving the goddess who that priest had been worshipped. Here, that of Kakota, an animist force originally from the neighboring state of Kerala, who has been assimilated as the Hindu god Shiva, but whose potential nemesis, a forest spirit, Chandi, attacks him at his festival every year. Uh, she's prevented from getting him by members of the crowd running and crash tackling her to the ground. It's the only ritual I know where a goddess is subjected to rugby league tackling. But never mind. You'll see in this slide to the Chenda drums, which I'll refer to later, associated with Kerala but found in, in Western Karnataka. Um, any festival that has been Hinduized or Sanskritized will feature Chenda drumming, uh, but not every festival that has Chenda drumming has been Sanskritized. So to look at the first of the processions. On a single day in late March of each year, brides and grooms from the nearby village of Biranani assemble below the Puttu Bhagavati temple. Bhagavati is a generic term for goddesses that have come to be associated with Parvati, Hindu god Shiva's wife. They are escorted by their parents who are offering them in marriage and, after a period of being photographed, are led in procession into the temple where the Brahmin priest waits. They process to the sound of Mangala Pat, a wedding song accompanied by the dudi, a hand-tensioned hourglass drum, a sound that is iconic of Kodavame. But there are a few things that are unusual about this wedding. The first is that the Kodava are not married by Brahmin priests. 
They do not marry in temples, and as far as I know, they do not marry en masse. The second is that the bride and brides and grooms are children between the ages of about five and fifteen. The third is that they are cross-dressed. The girls as grooms and the boys as brides. Buddha Bhagavati in Burunani is one of several sites and events in Kodagu where the normal Sanskritic order is inverted and, oh sure, just should show you a little of the procession. Sorry, it's not expanding. Let me get out of... Sorry. Buddha Bhagavati is one of several sites and events in Kodagu where the normal Sanskrit order is inverted and to quote, we worship with the reverse of what the goddess would normally want. For example, the temple faces west, not the usual east. The reason given is that Bhagavati felt underappreciated in Kodagu and decided to leave, but was prevented from so doing by a chaundi, a forest spirit. The Pomangala, which this ceremony is called, has moved from being a small devotion at home to what it is today in the last few decades, hinting at that negotiation between the private and the Kodava on the one hand, the public and the more Hindu on the other. Typically, the presenting of children in the Pomangala was an act of thanks had the child been unwell in the preceding year, or a request for some benefit, particularly success in exams. Moving on, the temple for the festival at, for Bhagavati in this village, Kolakeri, is much more Sanskritized, though it still features two hallmarks of Kodavame, the presence of Dudi, which you can see here, and possession, which you can't. Part of the ceremony is taking the goddess to a nearby river where she is bathed. According to my consultants, a few years ago, it was decided that the journey to the river was too rough for women. Why this should be the case was met with a sort of indifferent shrug, physical or metaphorical, that unfortunately I often received when asking about restrictions on women. And in actual fact, when participating myself in processions from temple to river or forest shrines, I rarely saw women participants. As an alternative here, they were incorporated to the safer procession within the temple courtyard that acts as something of a climax to the two-day festival. In this, the deity is brought out on the head of a Brahmin who circumambulates the shrine, accompanied by chenda drumming of increasing intensity. But here, unlike in other such processions, the visual space has been in part reclaimed by the Kodava. Bhagavati is preceded by six identically clad Kodava women who carry lamps, another visual symbol of Kodavame. For the most of each round, these women walk backwards facing the goddess. At the end of each round, they walk forward. Dudis are played, though they are inaudible against the sound of the chende. Two groups of Kodama men, one ahead of the goddess but facing her, one behind, dance Bolkat, a particularly Kodava dance. The effect is spectacular in the early evening and polished. Finally, the Nari Mangala is a ceremony that is held to honor someone who has killed a tiger, and thus, it's, as a ceremony, it is basically extinct. Nevertheless, I recorded the song associated with the ceremony in Porida in 2008, though the last ceremony had been held there about 40 years previously. Sorry. 
It would not be difficult song to maintain. The melody is one of the small number used for duty accompanied songs, and Codova frequently now used written texts for singing. But the bond between the Codova and nature has been loosened by migration, modernity, and mainstream Hinduism. And it is likely that if this survives, this song I mean, it will be in decontextualized performances, something about which many Codova are ambivalent. And yet, even in this way, it may perhaps be used to memorialize or reinvoke Codova animism. Each year, Kodagu halts the world's largest single sporting competition in which over 300 teams fight to become hockey champions of the year. The opening procession is again an organized spectacle. And in the midst of this procession, we can find a reenactment of the Nari Mangala. So to finish up, the point that I would, two points that I would like to make is that in my own research and in the research of previous uh, people on Kodagu, there has been a tendency to see what is happening as a conflict or a tension between Kodavame and modernity both a general modernity that reflects in regulations against killing tigers and a particularly Indian form of modernity, which is the spread of Sanskritic Hinduism. I find it more profitable, more useful, more sympathetic, more in line with what many Cordova seem to insist on, to locate that tension within the Kodava way of life. So rather than attention within against Kodavame, attention within Kodavame. These tensions are exploited, negotiated, in part resolved, and aestheticized through performance. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, that was fascinating. Um, what, I, what I'll do now is I will ask um, a couple of questions and I will leave it up to Nick to, um, to you know, say whether, whether there's room for any more people to ask questions. Um, it may be that um, the people, you know, John's and Eve's details can go up if we don't have room for that and then people can ask questions later. Um, but Eve, um, I'd like to, it was great to see the images along with your music. Um, there was a wonderful sense of space, light and grandeur in, in your music and in the images themselves. And it, it, to see those together, um, particularly after you've described some aspects of your composition, um, it made, it, it really kind of brought things together and helped to understand more. Um, so my question is, there is a ritualistic aspect to any music, um, but it's particularly evident in opera um, and, and theatre, I guess. Um, sort of, it's, you know, focusing um, emotions communally through a ritual, which is similar to what happens in a religious ritual. So do you think this contributes to the story of the Aspen Papers that the opera is telling? Um, that it sort of enhances and expands on that story. Um. It's so interesting. There's so much ritual behind opera. And I did allude to the first composer that was supposedly the first um, Western operatic performance. Um, and the, the ritual of opera is actually very practical and technical because uh, operas go for so long, you know, maybe two, the Barocca operas often went for two and a half hours. So they, by following the, um, the overture, aria, chorus, recitative, it allowed the um, audience to have um, breaks. They'd have a very rich bit of music and then they'd have something that allowed them to take a breath, as it were. So there seemed to be... Um, something very wise and practical in that. <laughs> but for me, the rituals came out of Venice itself. It was such a um, incredible 
city. It was a city of refugees uh, that grew to be one of the greatest republics in the world. And it had its political um, rituals by which you couldn't become a doge, which is like their, their version of the ruler, without going through, I think it was 27 processes. So nobody could take power. Um, so, uh, and of course, the incredible uh, church rituals um, of Venice, it was so rich. Yes, so um, doing anything to do with Venice uh, was a gift, you know, like to have a story set in Venice was, um, how lucky was I? <laughs> Does that answer your question? I think so. I mean, um, because you talked about um, musical materials that you use and they have symbolic associations, um, you know, the Monteverdi, for example, and the Italian folk music. Um, and in, in ritual, the symbolic associations is one of the key elements of ritual. Um, and this is something that you've done very consciously. Um, and it's, it's created the music. I mean, th there are musical ideas that you wouldn't have thought of without those symbolic associations, I'm sure. So um, that that seems to me another layer of ritual. As a, lot well of as the... a lot of it's in retrospect, Claire. I look back now and I, I David Malouf asked me to um, make Venice a fifth character. So every day mm -hmm. I either read the history of Venice or I looked at Venetian artwork and the whole chiaroscuro that was very centred in Venice seemed to come out of light and shade and I didn't even realize later how important that was in terms of my own spiritual approaches um so it's it's mm -hmm. and, and I have to thank Nicholas for uh making us talk for only 10 minutes because I wouldn't have done the iMovie Nicholas so thank you <laughs> yes no the the uh the as, as you were saying, that, that sense of um, space and grandeur and, and you're talking about the light and the shade, um, it really, you can, you can really sense it in your music um, and I guess that, that does sort of really enhance the ritual, the, the ritualistic kind of aspect of opera that you're working with. And there are probably other rituals, thank you Claire, to do with disease, for instance. I mean, of all the thousands of buildings in Venice, I chose the one that was um, commissioned in a response to a pandemic. <laughs> and so this had been, this is the only time I've spoken about the um, this overture. Right, yeah. very timely. <laughs> well, I'm sorry I'm not bringing it back to ritual. I, I think I have to think more about that. That's all well, fine. Well, sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just saying that that was all fine in terms of the connection to ritual. Yeah. And yeah. You know. I, I, th I think you made a number of points and I've, I've just kind of brought them out, um, but you did make a number of points that did relate to ritual and um, um, uh, very interesting to sort of compare the ritual of um, a theatre, opera, and, and sort of European theatre and the sort of ritual that um, John was talking about. Um, yeah. Uh, it was a fascinating talk um, and I was particularly struck by your last comment um, that the tension between the different traditions, the animism and Hinduism, um, that tension being resolved through music. Um, I wondered if you'd like to say a little bit more about that, John, and oh. how, how that actually is resolved by music. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, say it's solely resolved, but it's certainly negotiated through these these actual events, often by the layering of of different musical activities. Uh, so, uh, in some of the more complex uh, temple rituals, you'll simultaneously um, have a traditional account of what this place is about at the same time time that you'll have the chanted drumming which is seen as directly invoking the actual power of the deity um, so it, it's it's often in in that sort of uh, way that these things are actually in, invoked um, there are more um, obvious uh, negotiations take place in women's music which are the duty cod part which you saw here isn't is almost entirely a male uh, genre. I, I would say it was entirely a male genre, but um, only last week there's a little film clip uh, came through one of my Facebook 
um, feeds, um, which featured a group of young Cordova learning Dudi Kotpat, these Dudi based songs. And there was a, a girl in that group, whether she'll be able to continue that into into adult. But in the, the women's performances, there's a, a, a much closer negotiation. There's much more likely to take on bhajans and singing uh, practices of that are related to South Indian uh, Hinduism. And in their dance dance form, um, Umatat, which was originally danced around the light, it's often now danced around uh, uh, a woman dressed as the goddess Kaveri. The Kaveri is a, a river that has its source in, in Kodagu, and for the Kodava it is an animist force, a force of nature, a force of fertility. Um, in more mainstream Hinduism, it's a remover of sins. You know, you go to the river to, to wash away your sin. So there are these constant little ways in which things pop up and are negotiated and you can unpick slowly. Yeah. Right. And and with the, the melodies, um, is it possible to um, kind of know the sources of the melodies and, and whether they come out of the animus tradition or whether they've been influenced by um, Hindu traditions? The only thing we can say with any certainty is that the melodic structures used for the Dudikot part resemble much more closely um, other tribal traditions in the, the region. Um, they're usually only tritonic or tetratonic at the most, three or four notes. Um, and the, the manner of delivery, which is what you heard in the second example, not so much in the first example, the manner of delivery is to deliver in pairs of singers who ornament um, distinctively and individually, such that, so that you get a very thick um, heterophonic texture. Um, and so the melodic structure and the mode of delivery has almost no sort of resemblance to what you'd expect is the, the obvious thing is um, Hindu devotional music or bhajan singing. Um, um, in its in its way. So I think I, I've previously argued that the way of singing is itself a way of resisting um, this sort of mainstream um, impact. Um, it's also completely has never been, as far as I can tell, been used for any sort of um, uh, fusion music. Um, there's a tradition that's grown up there of, of uh, Valiga mix, which uh, mixes another tribal music that is used for dancing with uh, modern beats and technologies. But as far as the Dudi Kotapata is concerned, I've yet to hear any instance of intercultural mixing. Right. That, that's really interesting. So that, that uh, ritual um, becomes important in, in the sense of identity and perhaps self-determination. Yeah, yeah peaceful way <laughs> yes it is it is generally it's an area where there is a there is a, a a sort of autonomy movement but it is completely peaceful you know there's no um no it's an not a place of threat yeah. hi everybody thanks for a wonderful day so far it's been uh, really intriguing and um as somebody suggested i think we need another day to ask lots of questions from the amazing presentations we've had. Um, today, or the next little bit, is um, I suppose the end to a wonderful day. And it's also our chance to meet Associate Professor Bruce Crossman, who's been diligently there all day. I've been keeping me, keep my eye on him. So good on you, Bruce, for hanging in there. He's from the Western Sydney University. Uh, he's a composer, scholar with eclectic interests across visual arts, poetry and music with a focus on Pacific European musical identity. He's achieved international recognition in Australasia, Asia, Europe and the USA. His highlights include projects with the Kangawana, Kangawana Philharmonic, I, I, I butchered that, apologies, and the Korean Symphony Orchestra and the Asian Music Festival 2014 opening concert. Um, as I said, Bruce is from Western Sydney University, so really looking forward to his presentation. Over to you, Bruce. Thank you very much, Richard. It was wonderful um, at the beginning of your day. I don't seem to have come up. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Sure can. Loud and clear. Oh, great. So my voice is getting a bit hoarse of my asthma. So um, thank You've you. You've been singing much. long all day, have you? <laughs> yeah, I have. 
<laughs> so I, I love your attitude, this wonderful idea that we can make visible the multicultural dimensions of our community and that we can reframe that as a form of Australian identity. I think that's where you know, you know we have over 150 different language groups here in Western Sydney and I'm coming to you, as you've said, from Western Sydney in Glenmore Park at the foot of the Blue Mountains and I'm sitting on Darug lands. I enjoy the beauty of Mogo and Nature Reserve and I'd like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And, and part of these lands are we have these 150 different um, language groups as well as our indigenous people. And it's an amazing place for us to live and to be at this point in time. And what I would like, um, I was I reminded, that I, thank you, Dr. Wang, for that beautiful playing before and the subtlety of the breath and spirit behind that. It's interesting. I love the way that Banu was talking about, about creativity being like a habit, a quiet, an acquired faculty that is rooted in the soul or the spirit. And also the idea that it's embodied in um, breathing and playing material, and then that connects to the spiritual. But I love that cheekier side too, in the sense that you know you can travel to God by bus, maybe not now, and and because I'm in lockdown for the last three months on foot, or, and, and the fastest way is through music. And so what I would like to do here is to go through and um, just play you a, a little snippet of music and then I'll come back and present the ideas that I have here. Just give me a second. My... So my talk today really is about um, friendship and how that has opened up um, and changed me. I love the way that um, Karina was saying that, you know, hearing the Pipa player, in a sense, shocked her into a type of new reality. And there was no going back from that. And it's similar for me working with Tan Chung, Tan Chung from Hong Kong and play, writing for the Gusheng.
I'm just not going to be too me. No. So I love the way that Karina said that she'd been ambushed by the Pipa. And I think I was ambushed by the Gujang. So when I go to Hong Kong, the first thing Tan Ching does is ring me up and tell me, right, we're going for 11 breakfasts together starting today. And we have a three or four hour breakfast. And then we it's a friendship and then a transmission of culture through friendship. And what I wanted to do today is to talk about some three principles um, for working uh, interculturally. And I'll just find my screen share here. And, um, Bruce, how much longer are you going to need? Um, 10 minutes. Is that all right or not? I can. You're going to need an extra 10 minutes, you're saying? Or? Um, this, I've, this talk is time for 10. I can cut it short. Okay, so what I wanted to do here is this is beautiful slide here where Sega Akiyashi, who's a Japanese architect, says, the beauty of architecture lies not only in design or architecture techniques, but it also derives from the soul that dwells inside the wood. And what, he, what he's really saying here is that, you know, it's not about the design of the ideas. It's not necessarily about the mathematics and the materiality of the architecture, although it involves those things. But behind that, there is the, the wood has a type of spirit that really sings. And that's what art making is about. It's really about that uh, expressing spirit that is behind that. And so what I, I'm talking about today is I want to present three sort of ideas about this. Um, and when I... So and I would say that the um, the way is that is that boundaries can be permeable, that ideas can be knowable, and that you can actually enter into a type of lateral thinking that enlarges you. And so here um, I want to talk about my friendships with Tomoyuki and Tan Ching. Um, Tomoyuki is on the left in Tokyo, and um, there's my wife and I with him, um, and then Tan Ching in her studio in Hong Kong. And so what the what happened here is that. After I'd been to this exhibition where I'd seen this Japanese architecture, you had traditional architecture with the wood interlocking. If you go into Kenji Kuma's um, architectural bridge spanning work in the heart of the Tokyo Art District. And then above it in Kanji was this statement about that creativity. Um, actually, the, really the heart of it is the spirit singing. And when I said this to Tomoyuki, he actually said, yes, actually, it's interesting you should say that because he says, we Japanese. Um, believe that behind wood and trees and in general our approach to life is this actually spirit. And so um, and so we it, it, this sort of started to open up another way of thinking for me. Um, and he and so and he related that to Shintoism and present in culture and in architecture and of course in the music that we both create. And so um, my point here is just using to, um, my friendship with Tommy to make this point is that this friendship in this case with a Japanese composer, the knowledge complexes of other worlds were beginning to awaken my conscious and subconscious to both fracture and hybridize my understanding. I did not want to hold to the old as the new had become awakened in me artistically. In a sense, through friendship, I traced a journey from permeable to knowable to lateral to singing. Ethnomusicologist Stephen Nuss argues that intercultural exchanges are not about hard boundaries that imprison and exclude, but rather they are marked as permeable by a type of cultural fluidity situated in respect 
and a knowledge of difference that can create new hybrid grounds um, through encounters. The, the next point here is that, you know, this permeability through friendship was starting to change the way that I thought. And it's like Karina was saying, it strikes you like a lightning bolt out of the blue and you realize once you open up to the way these sounds work, uh, to the culture behind it, to the, um, to the color and bends of the notes, you can't go back. You've changed, you've become something else. And, um, so, and so out of this genuine friendship here with um, Tan Ching, um, it says this becomes knowledge and respect. The physical presence of myself at intercultural events throughout Asia allows me to enter into a type of knowing that is heartfelt. It's an experiential presence that presents the creative aesthetic behind a culture. Chinese Zhang player Tan Ching in a Causeway studio and at my kitchen table in Glenmore Park here in Western Sydney revealed the sonic beauty of her ancient instrument. It was deeply moving to me and the personal explanations of the instrument and the technique enabled to me to enter into what Nuss would say as seeing the knowable knowledge complexes of other identifiable um, borders identified by a particular um, accessible, learnable and deterioritized complex. In other words, you can actually enter into knowing um, other ideas by um, humility and talking to people and then beginning to write and explore in, in an intercultural way. And um, Foucault, who Nas quotes, puts it, he says, well, what is the impossibility you think here? And what is the impossibility are we faced with? And he's talking about when he first traveled to China and becoming aware of the beauty of Chinese culture. And he goes, but what's the impossibility of beginning to think Chinese? And so what he's really saying is that you can actually begin to enter into ideas of other and think and understand. And actually it, it changes and the borders dissolve and it's no longer other. It's become part of, your, uh, of who you are as a person. And for me, in a, in a journey in terms of writing, I've actually, I prefer now to write for um, East Asian entrants than I do Western ones because through my conversations, I have changed. I remember when I first went to the Philippines with Ramon Santos, rewrote my program note, which said that I, I was improvising on Filipino Kulantong fragments. And he rewrote it back the other way, saying that I didn't use Filipino Kulantong fragments in my uh, music and it had completely reframed and changed my voice. And I thought, he's absolutely right. I, I, had, I hadn't colonized, it, it had colonized me, I had changed. I become different through this intercultural engagement. And I think this is the beauty that we can have within the cultures in Western Sydney that actually we can change through um, engagement. And so through here, um, you've got some of the ideas and attempts in of a musical sense where with this piece that I just played you uh, with Strange Invisible Perfume, where um, I'm engaging with Tang Shan Ju's poetry, where he talks about such sun rouge blush, damp with rain. You've got the Judeo-Biblical traditions, the transcendent beauty of I opened to my beloved. And you've also got Shakespeare's strange invisible perfume, where he talks about Cleopatra having a strange invisible perfume that hits the sense, a type of sensuality that, um, that changes you. And so here, in a sense, this the peaking opera gongs, the sudden demarcations, the quivering mallets, the articulated bell clear harmonics, the wriggling tones, um, the idea of the soft yuan um, sounds emergent afterwards became a type, it, it changed the way that I was thinking about music. For me, um, they became a type of living color palette, a type of graduations. And we're putting a voice to what Richard was saying about multiculturalism becoming a type of voice for us in Australia. I think this living color concept of how we work um, actually has a face in this sense. And so I come through to this lateral idea of lateral thinking, which has its roots in Confucian thought for me. So um, literary scholar Edwin Ho notes this disciplinary approach in Chinese music and is seeing it as a social phenomenon that embraces other activities, such as poetry, literature, painting, and calligraphy. The very sources of qi and energy which drive creating stretch across multi-disciplinary um, sources with its nature of motion to communicate between realms and he talks about this like in painting you have qi on chengdu which is the manif manifestation of vitality in calligraphy it relates to the energy of the brush in motion and in chin playing which we heard tony weeder at the beginning um it the the, the down and the up movement of the uh, represent the qi the energy and then the, the yun, the more um, relaxed sort of um, meditative moments. And it leaves this sort of 
this yun idea, the subtlety of that, the subtle sounds leave this a residual impression or subtlety of lasting resonance, which is rooted in Chinese culture. I soon real and Chu notes as he says that the confluence across art forms in Chinese aesthetics. He says, I soon noticed that in China there is one important principle in aesthetics. That is, music, poetry, and painting are all united. In fact, Chinese calligraphy is the mother of all art forms. Visual arts commentator Edwin, Edwin Capon, who died recently, had this marvelous idea about Confucian. He said, in Chinese thought that, Confuci that horizontal thinking is for today. And he says, the great thing about Confucius is that he was a generous. He practiced horizontal thought. And what he was saying is he thinks that great ideas actually come from horizontal thought, from intercultural engagement, to revitalize and change us by talking to others. So my conclusion here is that really, what, what is these dangerous ideas that I'm talking about? Well, outside cultural silos against hyper-secularism, we need, we need, can we allow the materiality of our artistic practice to sing, to sing? I cautiously and somewhat nervously dare to suggest that within my own artistic practice, there are three principles of creative thinking. The three principles are, there's the permeable boundaries within creativity where intercultural friendships allow border crossing and can open up new knowledge traditions related to my Asian Pacific locale, which is the value that Richard is putting to, to these 150 different cultural groups we have here. Secondly, as we start to be humble and talk to people, the knowable knowledge complexes through humility and cultural exchanges become insights. And so we actually begin to enter into how other people think. And it no longer becomes other, it becomes part of us. There is no boundary. I like this idea, you know, in love there are no boundaries that was presented in the talk earlier. Um, and then what I would say is that in Confucian lateral thinking, it allows us up to this hybrid thought and all these ranges of ideas, as um, Narita would talk about in architecture. He would say all these different influences changing us in life is actually like life changing and the changing of life actually um, is, is continue refreshing. And if we allow this continual refreshing through us, through intercultural engagement, we actually become fresh in our creative thinking by considering others. Thank you, Ruth. We had a, uh, a button for a round of applause. That was awesome. <laughs> Great to hear your thoughts. And uh, what comes to mind uh, for me is something that I learned long ago, was, uh, which is community arts and cultural development. And they talk about when you're working with community to be able to listen and to find out what they need. And uh, your work in Asia sounded like it brought you to that space. And when they found out what you needed as well, for <laughs> you becoming more like that and now writing for Asian instruments sounds quite a transformation that's quite beautiful so thanks so much for sharing that and um, look forward to hearing more about your work that's great um, we have a final thing for today uh, thanks everyone for hanging in there I know we've gone over time didn't want to stop Bruce it was uh, such a beautiful presentation uh, Emeritus Professor Larry Sitsky, AO, it's Australian National University of Music from the Australian National University School of Music. Larry was born in China of Russian Jewish parents. He has received many honours and awards, such as the Order of Australia, over his long and prestigious career as composer, performer, researcher, and educator. His music has been played by every Australian orchestra. That's pretty amazing. And he's been invited on cultural visits to China, Russia, and the USA. Unfortunately, he isn't here this afternoon, but in theme of, you know, music and spirituality, he's gonna be, um, <laughs> he's gonna be reincarnated as Dr. Nicholas, who's going to now read his paper. So um, thank you, Nicholas, for um, sharing the professor's uh, work. Over thank to you. Thank you very much, Richard, thank you. Um, for being a wonderful chair and um, allowing Bruce to tell us all those wonderful things and his summary of the entire day as well. It's wonderful to, that he was here for the entire day. Thank you, Bruce. That was fantastic. Um, so, yeah, so I'm here channeling the voice of um, my former PhD supervisor, um, Larry Sitsky, um, who, because um, of his age and because he lives in Canberra, um, can't really appear here. He doesn't use computers much, especially Zoom. Uh, I don't think he can do so. I'm going to read his... Uh, Treatise was well, a very short summary. 
of uh, music and spirituality in the 21st century, a personal view. For a long time in the history of Western music, the link between broadly religious comp compositions and the composer was obvious within the perceived mainstream and was largely controlled by the established institutions of churches. Even after composers were emancipated from this direct yoke imposed by religious organizations, they still largely adhere to forms stemming from religious practices and serving some sort of ceremonial function. Here, the continued plethora of masses, requiems, oratoria, and the like. At the beginning of the 20th, 20th century, there was a huge swell of interest in non-Western beliefs, as well as the birth and growth of the spiritualist movement. A fascination with the occult and such matters as trance, seances, and of theosophy were evident. Madame Blavatsky had almost single-handedly opened the floodgates of Western perception to influences from the East. Composers were made quite suddenly aware of new tonal and modal scales coming from what was generally labelled to be Eastern culture. When early in the 20th century, Ferruccio, Ferruccio Busoni gave a tempo indication of lento occulto in his Sonatina Seconda, probably for the first time in Western music, he heralded this new approach. And then in his opera, Dr. Faust, he openly made use of magical ritual as a compositional device. The second huge deluge of change came after the Second World War, when such consciousness was augmented by the serious study of shamanism, coupled with the power of ritual. It became obvious to many composers that the structures of the many rituals observed and documented by anthropologists and ethnomusicologists could be viable compositional tools, greatly increasing the armory of composers. I am here not speaking of cuddly, good feel, hippie attitudes, which certainly had a role to play in such phenomena, but which also cheapened and ultimately debased the aristocratic wisdom of true mysticism and its search for enlightenment. My personal path, and such a path must be personal for each one of us, my personal path was deeply coloured by the mix of cultures that were my heritage. Thus, Hebraic and Buddhist chant, non-Western folk music and liturgy, Russian, Russian mysticism, study of the Kabbalah, and Chinese cultural aspects. It is evident to me that music has the power to elevate us to a higher dimension of being. During a public forum held at the Moscow Conservatorium to celebrate my 85th birthday, a question came from the floor. How do you view your place in Australian music? I had never actually considered such a question before, but found myself saying that I suppose I was a kind of Australian Skriabin because of an evolving but consistent entanglement with the occult, the magical, shamanism, ritual, and a deeply personal pathway through this maze of possible pathways. My contribution to this conference or symposium was going to be a new composition, a concerto for me, Nicholas Ung, that is doing it rather than talking about it, the long journey rather than the destination, although some sort of destination, some kind of connection with the world of higher knowledge and vibration is always there as a driving force. In this work, I referred to a particular yogic system known as the Diamond Path, derived from Tibetan and Mongolian beliefs. It has been my good fortune to feel at home within a variety of backgrounds. And so he ends with saying that this composition should have been performed this year, um, but because of COVID, um, we can't perform his Erhu Concierto, but maybe in the ne near future. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening to the words of Professor Larry Zitsky. Nick, um, do you have any insight into what the diamond path was or is or did I uh, it's a, it's a, yeah i mean it's a form of spiritual teaching yeah a sutra you know um that he uh kind of uh turned into a piece of music uh yes so thank you everyone thank you for a wonderful symposium thank you richard all the key speakers um panelists um professor han for hosting this Diana Blom from HCA, who also helped us program day two, which is tomorrow. Am I missing? I'd like just to say, um, Nick, before you uh, say goodbye on behalf of your organization, that on behalf of the festival, it's wonderful to have this. I'd like to thanks Jing and yourself for your belief in this thing. And um, I think if you've listened to a lot of what's going on, there is a great 
a feeling amongst us. And as I said at the start, there's a, a great opportunity for us all to somehow connect in the future. Um, so again, as I said at the start, if you've got any wacky ideas and you've got no money, join my club and uh, we'll try and find a way to do stuff together. So as I said earlier, we're doing a crazy thing with Kim and a few other organisations of creating a national network for uh, culturally lived in cald music across Australia. So um, that's a crazy enough thought in this time. So we encourage crazy thoughts because our visions shall come shall come through at some time. So thank you again and uh, thanks, Nick. Yeah, I just want to echo Richard's you are, you are not so crazy at all. It's just so inspiring and to see so many, you know, great musicians, composers, researchers getting together. It's just incredible and in incredibly rich. And we really should get together in person sometime next year, you know, like when the COVID is over. And we do need to keep this ongoing, continuing. It's it's a go it's just a gold mine. It's just so much. And look at Bruce's work, it's incredible, it's breathtaking. And you know, all of your speech is just so wonderful. And I just want to thank you all, really, for your wonderful contributions and the effort you put in each and every single presentation is so very well pre prepared. And I'm really incredibly grateful and uh, thankful to you uh, all your effort. And Danique, yes, uh, <laughs> has done a huge amount of work behind uh, the scene, obviously. But yeah, we, we just have this very talented Nick. You know, so getting you all together, I, I can't thank you enough. And I do hope to see you sometime next year 